Ephesians chapter number 6, and I want to just go down to verse number 10, and I want to start here this evening, and then we'll go back and we'll kind of break this down. And we're going to take a few weeks to look at, at some of these things that are here. I think they go hand in hand, really, uh, with the study that we're doing on Wednesdays about angels. They're, we're engaged in a conflict. We're in, uh, engaged in a battle, and it's not just between angels, good angels and bad angels. It's also engaged between us as believers and hell itself. And of course, God has angels that I believe do assist us and help us. And we'll look at that in the weeks ahead there on Wednesdays. But also, uh, we have an active role to play as well. And sometimes, sometimes the enemy comes at us directly. And the angels ain't there, so to speak, to help us. And it's up to us to be able to defend our relationship with God and our commitment to God and uh, to endure this and to make it through victorious. So let's look here at Ephesians chapter number six and let's start at verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you, may, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having the loins, your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And uh, I think I'm going to stop there for right now. And uh, we may come back and get some of those others in another, another service. But uh, this is the armor of God. And tonight as we talk about uh, being armor bearers for the cause of Christ, I think in this hour, the only way we're going to be successful is to put on this whole armor of God, uh, wear it all. And we're going to talk about that tonight. But let's look here at the first verse. Finally, my brethren, Paul, as he's talking to this church at Ephesus, he's coming to the conclusion. He's coming to the, to the last point. And uh, that's regarding what us as believers kind of summing everything up. We're putting on the armor of God. There's a, there's a work for us to do. But as you look at this, there's a, he starts with this word finally. And finally here is almost a synopsis of all the other topics that he's covered. All of them are uh, prerequisites to this place. All of them are, are the building blocks for you and I to get the armor of God. When we, <clears throat> when we think of, you know, you go to school or you go to college or whatever, uh, if you want to take a certain class, sometimes uh, you've got to take other classes before you can take that class that you may want. And so there's a lot of prerequisites that are there. Or, or you know, you've got to, if you want a certain job at a place and, and it's got a list of requirements that you've already been trained in before you take that new level. And I think for us as believers, Paul is getting to this place. That's kind of what he's saying here is there are some things as a believer that he, God's goal is to make you worry, warriors, not warriors, warriors, uh, people that are willing to fight, people that are able to fight. That is the goal of God and not just fight, but to stand, to withstand all of these words that are used here, I believe are ordained of the Holy Ghost. God gives us the tools to stand and to fight. He equips us. Now, to get to this place, there are some requirements. There are some first things first in order to be the most victorious. It is rare, very rare, that you would join a sports team and you become the first place starter on like a varsity team having just showed up the very first time. There are, you've got conditioning to do, you've got training to do, you've got playbooks to memorize, you've got the fundamentals to cover. All of those things are prerequisites for you being the new starting quarterback or whatever it is on that team. It, it just doesn't happen that way. Just You just, oh, look at me, I'm a mighty warrior for the gospel. And uh, I think there's a lot of people that think, well, you know, I'm just going to walk in. I got saved yesterday. Guess what? I'm a preacher. And, you know, anybody can print out those papers on the internet. I don't know if you knew that or not. Every one of you can be ordained ministers if you so desire. That does not make you a preacher. 
It doesn't even make you a, a Christian if you get one of those certificates. And as sad as it may sound, but it is the truth. God wants us to be soldiers. There is work that goes into it. Let's go back to the very beginning of the book of Ephesians. I don't want to be here all night in this little topic, but we, we're going to take some time looking at some things that God has for us as believers, as warriors. I want to get to the place where I'm a soldier equipped to win. Amen. And I believe that's God's position for all of us tonight. God wants to be he wants you to be equipped in 2023, amen, as a soldier, willing and able to win. Go back in chapter number one. We'll just zoom through some of these. You see in chapter one, verses one and two, you see the introduction. As you go to verses three through 16 of chapter one, you can start to just scroll down through here. And he's talking about the redemption of the Lord. He's talking about how God brings us into the family of God, verses five and uh, four, five, and six, uh, and, and how He's redeemed us through His blood. And uh, what a foundation to be a soldier in the army of God. You think salvation plays an important part? Amen. Of course it does. Uh, if you're going to be successful, uh, even as a soldier for Jesus Christ, uh, uh, you better you better realize that He's washed away your sins. Uh, he's ordained you to do this. He's He's saved your soul. Then you you get down to verse number seventeen of this chapter, and there's a little bit of a shift. Amen. Now, now that I'm saved, I'm, I'm a mighty warrior for God. Well, you ought to pray about a few things. Do you notice what it tells you to pray for there in verse uh, number uh, seventeen? Pray for wisdom. Pray for knowledge and uh, get your eyes of understanding opened up that you can know what God's will is for your life. I'd say if you're going to be a victorious soldier, you better be in communication, amen, with the one who's in charge of the army. You better know him. You better know his design, his will, his desires, his plan for your life. Uh, know some of his scriptures, his word. Uh, know some things about God. Get down to chapter number two, verses one through three. You, st you start to look at where you used to be before you knew Christ. You who he hath quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we are all had our conversations in, in the past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. If you're going to take and come out of that group where you used to be, and in theory be a combatant against those where you used to be, you better make sure you realize who the enemy is. And that's really what these verses are talking about. You were in, at enmity with God. You were an adversary of God. And here in these first couple of verses, he puts us in that place. We walked, and notice there in verse number two, chapter two, we walked in lock, stock, and barrel with the, the world's desires for our life. Whatever hell wanted, we obeyed. It drove us. We were good soldiers in the army of the enemy. Now, if you're in God's army, you've got to remember that lest you go back. As you scroll down, you start in verse 4 through 10. You start to see the grace of God that loved us even while we were in that state. How, how awesome the love of God. And we sung about it tonight. Uh, amen. How God raised us up and, and took us in verse number 6 to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It was by grace that we're saved in verse number 8. Amen. And not by our works. God's love reached down to us. These are some of the fundamentals of the faith. As you roll down, you start to see in verse number 11 through 22, uh, you start to see how God reconciles us with Him. How He pulls us out of that uh, worldly stuff and brings us in with a covenant and promise, uh, having no hope we, uh, before us. Uh, and now that we have Christ, uh, amen, now we have that hope. He is our peace in verse number 14. Uh, amen. Uh, that was brought to us. He's abolished the flesh. Uh, amen. In verse number 15. Uh, and uh, he, in verse number 16, that he might reconcile us to God. There's a, there's a change uh, of relationship, a, stain, or a change uh, uh, in uh, uh, our response. Uh, he has reconciled us back to God. As you move into chapter number three, you start to see, uh, amen, 
that Paul says in in, in uh, chapter three, verses uh, one through uh, two, uh, three rather, uh, about him being a prisoner for the cause of Christ. Amen. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. We want freedom today, but our freedom means that we're free from our sin. Paul put himself as a prisoner for Christ. He's not upset about this. He doesn't go on and on and on about God's legalistic. He's, he's so demanding of me. He wants so much of me. I can't believe how much he requires of me. I can't believe how much he's asking of me. Uh, amen. He, he's giving you that God's grace uh, is so into his life and his love for God is so great. He recognized I'm a prisoner of God, but that's not a problem for me. That's good for us to know because at times it's going to feel like uh, we're, we're pl plodding on through things. Amen. But we've got to keep on moving for the cause of Christ. And he goes all the way down uh, through this chapter 3 explaining uh, about his, his commitment to God and God's commitment to him uh, and uh, the love that he has for the things of God. You get down to chapter number 4 and you start to see that he talks about a unity and growth in God. Amen. I'm a, therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called in verse number one. With all lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, enduring to keep, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body. And he goes into this uh, long discussion about uh, the unity and growth in God. You get down to verse number 24. He talks about being a new man in God and how he's changed him uh, fundamentally. Verse number 25, he begins a list of things uh, uh, that uh, he calls out. He talks about lying, anger, uh, giving place to the devil. Uh, about stealing. He talks about our mouth. Uh, he talks about being filled with the Spirit, getting rid of bitterness from our lives. All the way down to verse number 32, he goes on and on about these things that, that belong and don't belong in a Christian's life. And we need these things. If you're going to be a soldier, these are things uh, amen, that are fundamental for us being warriors. Then in chapter 5, he talks about uh, being followers of God as dear children, walking in the love of God, loving one another. Hallelujah. And uh, <clears throat> verse number 3, he talks about fornication filthiness down to verse number eight idolatry things that would hinder us in our relationship to god verse number eight through 14 he talks about the contrast between light and darkness in our lives as christians we've got to get out of the darkness and get into the light and walk in the light uh, he cautions us about our vain words uh, uh, that's in the previous section there in verse number uh, 15 through 17 he talks about walking upright being wise uh, Verse number 18 through 20 talks about us not being drunk with wine, but being filled with the Spirit. He talks about, in verse number, uh, is that, uh, um, be not drunk with wine, where is excess? Verse 18, speaking yourselves in songs and hymns, uh, uh, singing, making melody in your hearts, giving thanks always unto God. Amen. And so instead of putting the booze in, uh, but we're letting the, the words of the Spirit come out. We're letting the, the things of the heart, we're not tainting, uh, amen, what's going into our life, but we're allowing good things to be placed within. Uh, and those good things, the songs, are such an overflowing uh, uh, joy that comes out of our lives. Uh, amen. We're giving God glory. We're worshiping Him. We're singing. We're making melody. Then, as you move on in verse number 21, uh, down through chapter 6 and verse number 4, he talks about families, moms and dads, and, and all that's associated with that. He talks about children and them being obedient. He talks about dads again and uh, covering the family. Verses 5 through 9 of chapter 6, he talks about servants and masters. <coughs> all of these things are important to get us ready to the place where we're warriors. These things cover our conditioning. They cover our training. When you look at that today, you look at conditioning. Conditioning, amen, helps you to go the entire race. You run more than you will on race day. You condition your body to last longer than the game that you're playing. You condition, amen, your muscles, your joints, uh, Amen. You're breathing all of that. If you're going to run, you, you, you're going to run a, a mile. You don't just run one mile and stop. 
You push yourself beyond and you condition, you train, uh, you run sprints, you run long distance, you train and train and train working yourself to condition your bodies. As a Christian, these things that are in here, some of them are conditioning items where God's getting you ready to go the distance, to make it all the way to the end. And some of them seem so hard and seem so different from that former life. But all of these things are needed. And then he also couples it with training. We're not just running around willy-nilly. We have a prescribed route. We have a defined uh, 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 circle that we're running. We, we have a defined course uh, that we're upon. Some of these items here, uh, amen, are to make us more skillful as warriors. So you have the soldier that is, you know, the sloth. Uh, and nobody wants him. You've got the, the football player that can't run. Nobody wants him on his team. Uh, you, you've got the, uh, the kicker, you know, the, the, the kickball player. Uh, amen. It's got their right foot all bandaged up. Nobody wants them on their team. You, and you look at all of these things, uh, and uh, there's a lack of, of, of organization. There's a lack of ability. Uh, there's a lack of, of hopefully winning. You get, you get somebody out there that's never played baseball before, and you're like, well, this is, this is, why would I want him on my team? If he's never played baseball, he probably doesn't have the first clue how to hit a ball and, and how to catch a ball and how to, how to function. And so uh, the training that God gives us and the conditioning is to help us be good soldiers who will last in the conflict. I'm reminded of the greatest basketball player probably ever. And uh, people asked him about his success, and I don't make them my role models, but he said some good things, and that would, would have been Michael Jordan. He won six NBA titles down through the 90s as, as I was a young man uh, growing up. He said that this is a man that scored over 32,000 points in his career. That's, a, that's an astronomical amount of points. Uh, he was unprecedented of his time. He, there was nobody even close to him. As a matter of fact, I think he retired after he got uh, three uh, rings for the, the um, championship because it was, he, he got bored with it because there was nobody that was, could even line up to where he was. And I, I would agree with his talents, a very talented man. But he said, I had to embrace failure. But it didn't keep me failing. I had to understand that I did make mistakes. He said, do you know that I've missed over 9,000 shots during my career? <laughs> 9,000 shots. I just told you he's made over 32,000 points. He made plenty of points. He could have focused on all the baskets he scored. He said, I, I missed 9,000. He said, I've lost over 300 games. He said, 26 times. When the ball was given to me at the last second to make the game-winning shot, I failed and missed it. He had to brace, embrace his failure. He went on and said that I play every time, every game, every practice, every time that I get a ball in my hand, I play to win. I do not practice to fail. I do not plan to fail. I play, I practice every time to win. What a mindset we should have as Christians. Sometimes we play too much around with, with failure and we, 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 we embrace it. I understand we do fail at times uh, and, and uh, I, I, it'd probably do us well to count the number of times that we failed. It would probably do us well to look back at all the mistakes that we've had and contemplate about those things but not dwell there and get back up and know that we're going to play this thing to win this time. I can't imagine sitting there thinking 26 times I, I had the ball in my hand to make the winning shot and I missed it. I can't, I can't imagine that. And uh, him saying, you know what? I don't, I don't play at practice just to mess around. I play to win. They said that he was one that embraced the fundamentals. Every time he touched the ball, the fundamentals were important. How to catch, how to shoot, how to stand, how to position himself. Every one of those things mattered. And he said this. He said what, the greatest thing that he feels was an achievement to him was that he always stayed coachable. He was, one of the, he was the best. The best there was. He could have coached many teams. He could have told others so many times how to do it. 
But he wanted to stay coachable. As you look back, you say, well, he, he could have been better. He said there was always more to learn and there was always ways to be better. He had to learn to take criticism. He had to learn to push beyond what the best was. Try to be better. I think for us as Christians, one of the most important things is that we stay coachable. If we're going to be warriors for the kingdom of God. There's times we can look back, we can count our failures, we can count our mistakes, we can look at them, we can look back and we can see the shortcomings of where we've been, the things that we should have done better, differently. Sometimes I feel like as Christians we just play, we're just playing games. We don't care, care whether we win or not. But church, we're, every day we go to practice, every time we go to church, every time we open our Bible, we need to realize we're in it to win it. And we're going to fight until the very end. Here in verse number 10, as it says, finally, my brethren, these, all these things that we've talked about that I read about those earlier verses give us, give us things that we need to coach, be coached on. Every one of these things, Sister Cheryl's talking about Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 2, 3, all of those good things, coachable moments for our lives, things that we need to work on as believers. These things here in Ephesians, great things for us to work on. Go back, remember where you were. Th these, these are fundamentals to the faith. These are all fundamental doctrines. The redemption, the adoption of God, bringing it in, realizing we're at war with the enemy. All of these things are, can I say, our basic training for God's one and desire. God doesn't want a bunch of Christians remaining in basic training. He wants you out as warriors for the kingdom of God. In verse number 10, he says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We're, we're not going to get to where we are with God on our own. It wasn't by our own that saved us. And it's not going to be by our own that we become soldiers. Yes, God has given us the list of things to do. But this list of things that God has given us to do, we've got to get a hold of God and ask him for his strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We go back and we look at these things. We fail when we do it on our own. We look back at some of these things and we, we can say, yeah, I, I messed that one up. And this is why we need the power of God. There's strength in numbers. When you and God join forces. Go, go with me if you would back to Ephesians chapter number 1. This is how Paul starts this book off in verse number 19. He says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? From the very early moment in our walk with God to the place where we become warriors, God's got the exceeding power to make me what we need to be. The United States military tells that to their new recruits. Forget about you. Forget about what you want to do. But if you do the things we teach you, you're going to be mighty warriors. If you follow the regiment, if you go do the drills, if you listen to your sergeant, if you listen to the commanding officers, you do all these things. When this is all said and done, we're going to make you the toughest, meanest fighting force in the world. I don't know if they're still telling them that or not, but they used to. Hallelujah. You're going to be the wokest military force in the world. I don't know what they're telling them nowadays, but that was the goal. And church God, he's got the power. He's got the might. He's got the strength. We're in his army. And his goal is that every believer, young or small, becomes a warrior for the kingdom of God. And if you'll follow his process, you will stand and look health straight in the face. And by God's grace and his strength, you will overcome. You'll be victorious. He'll help you. And this is what God's offering us here. As we look at these, this text and these verses of the, of the weapons that God equips us with. And the tools that God gives us. He's making us what we need to be. But we need to prescribe to his plan. Let's move on here to verse number 11 tonight. And that's probably where I'll, I'll end it here. Put on the whole armor of God that ye, may, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word in our Bible, the words whole armor is really only one 
Greek word. And that one Greek word is a compound word. But the compound word, I think, is so interesting. And the translators captured it so right as they did every time. But it simply means this. Each and every part. All of it. The whole of it. Every tool, every implement, every utensil, every bit of the armor that God has given us. Take unto you the whole armor of God. Every bit of it. Every part of it. Leaving nothing out. I, I think I told you a reference there Wednesday night about a, a preacher that says that some only take a part of the armor of God. You'll fall. Oh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put this piece of the armor of God on. You won't make it. You know what they're doing today? We're leaving out the word of God. So already you're at, your, you're at a disadvantage. You can make no effective strikes against the enemy without the word of God. Already you're at a loss. Already you're giving up ground. Already you're ducking and you're cowering. Think of it tonight. God tells us if we're going to be effective soldiers, there's not one piece of the armor we're going to talk about uh, in, in future lessons. Uh, not one piece you can stand to do without. This is your commanding officer tonight. This is the Lord tonight speaking to us. He's given us this direction. Every part matters. Lord, just my, my feet shod, your feet matter. Lord, my, my helmet, uh, amen, do I really need this heavy thing? Uh, yes, you do. The Romans lost the whole country because when the war wasn't raging, the armor that they wore was so heavy and cumbersome and uncomfortable that they slowly began to take it off. And as the war finally began to rage into Rome, the soldiers so unaccustomed to the, to, the, to the armor, even while the enemy rolled in, didn't bother putting the armor back on. And all of Rome was lost. When I look at it tonight, all it takes is one little area where the enemy can find a place to attack, and he's going to attack it tonight. As effective warriors for the kingdom of God, God wants you to take and put on every part. He's designed every piece. For a specific reason. Look here at what he tells us that you may be able to stand. This word stand that is used here is the prolonged form of the word stand. It's a stand for the long haul. It's a stand for the distance. It's a stand until the end. I'm going to stand until the fight is over. It's I'm going to, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to uh, lay down. It's, it's a committed stand that no matter how long this conflict lasts, I plan on being here to the very end. I've told you before that the coaches would burn into our heads 60 minutes, 60 minutes, 60 minutes. And it was just for a dumb game. Just to throw a ball back and forth and see you can go across the, a line that they painted on a beat, bunch of grass with people screaming their heads off. And you know what? Us as a bunch of fools would go out there and we would run those stupid sprints back and forth, at, touching every line, every five yards, up and down the whole football field. We would do those belly flop cruncher things that could probably bounce right back up now. Amen. Uh, where you'd run in place and you'd fall on your face and jump back up. And, and oh my, the, the wasted time as you look at it all. So that you could win a game. So you could be conditioned. And you know what? God tells us as believers. He wants to equip us. And it's up to us to put every part and piece of the armor of God on. So that we can stand for the distance. It's when we start taking our armor off. We will not stand. Look at what he uses. He, he gives us as the reason why. Because there's those, these wiles of the devil. This is the only time that word is used in your whole Bible. That word wiles. That Greek word that is used. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. Wiles. This means the trickery of tactics from the enemy. 
the enemy uses guerrilla warfare. He uses, he sneaks, he, he uh, uh, runs around looking, he's crafty. That's what this word wiles means. He's looking for an opportunity that's weak. During the Revolutionary War, Revolutionary War, did we not use that tool very effectively? The Iraqis and the, the terrorists over uh, in Afghanistan, did they not use their tools of trickery cr quite well? I remember going up and looking at the, the MRAPs there at Letterkenny years ago when the kids were small. I think we got to take a little ride in one. Do you kids remember any of that stuff? Uh, uh, pretty, pretty awesome climbing in there. But that MRAP was developed against the wilds of the terrorists. They planted those bombs along the roadside and it was blowing Hummers up. And, and with the Hummers, the troops that were inside, uh, it was maiming them and, and hurting them. And so they built a, a vehicle. It's got a V-shaped hole that when that bomb blew up, it blew it out the sides. But it kept the people inside safe. The whole reason it was developed was to stand against the wiles of the terrorist. God knows your adversary so well tonight. He knows him better than he knows himself. And every piece of the armor of God has been designed and refined in such a way that you can have confidence in knowing that if you put it on, you'll stand. If you crawled into that MRAP and you drove down the street, you can have every confidence that you'd survive when you got to the other side. And what a, what a morale change for the soldier that was trying to go from one point to the next uh, that was crawling into a Humvee before uh, and, and watching his crewmates blown to bits uh, and, and what a sad state uh, and imagine the terror in your own heart uh, but tonight uh, your governor uh, your commanding officer uh, uh, your greatest general tonight God Almighty uh, has designed uh, equipment uh, that is effective uh, against all of the tactics uh, of hell itself uh, there's not a demon uh, that can stand against it uh, there's not a force uh, that can overcome it. There's not a principality or power or rulers of the darkness that is effective as long as you, brother and sister, put on the whole armor of God. You can stand tonight. But it's up to us. Look at the times in our own lives when we become weak. Is it because we've taken that armor off? Is it those times and those areas of our life that the enemy hones in on. What made us so good during the Revolutionary War is we found the strong areas of the British and covertly we attacked it. We waited till they marched in a troop and from the woods we fired at them. We, we didn't engage in the correct rules of a gentlemanly war. But we won in that fight. And today you're in, a, in an engagement with, the hell, with hell itself. He's not playing the gentleman's rules of warfare. He's using every trick he's got in the book. He's using his craftiness. He knows your weak spots. Uh, he looks for a chink in your armor. He looks for that place uh, where he can take uh, aim at uh, and, uh, and be effective in destroying you. And he'll sit there and work at it uh, until he accomplishes it. But tonight, your God has not left you armorless. But is your armor rusty in the corner? Or is it well oiled, effective, cinched up and on tonight? We as good soldiers for the army of God have to recognize that God has loved us enough. We're not just numbers in his army. He's loved each one of you. One of the reasons why the war that Russia is waging against Ukraine is so brutal. Russia doesn't care about their soldiers. We'll just call up more men. We'll send them in. We'll send them off to their desks. We don't really care if they've got the right clothes. We don't care if they've got the right food. And, and as you look at the, the stories that are told, what a disastrous situation that it is over there. They're blowing up civilian structures. They're blowing up civilian homes. They're blowing up civilian uh, housing complex, houses. Uh, and, and their attacks are quite brutal. And there's a lot of people that have lost their lives in the civilian realm. And you look at what 
Ukraine is trying to do, and, and again, I, it, it's, it's, it's more than just this, but they're, they're honing in on where the Russian troops are in their territory. They're not just dropping bombs indiscriminately upon people, populations, but they're trying to find, a, they're, they're flying drones into Russian air bases and trying to blow up their planes. The planes that are blowing up indiscriminately the people in, in their own country. They're trying to find uh, Russians down in foxholes so they can have a drone drop a little grenade down on top of them and blow that, just that soldier up uh, and not take out other civilian casualties. You know why? Because Ukraine, it appears that they care about their people. Whereas Russia, well, just make some more and just send them on into battle. Not a big deal to us. Tonight, the enemy doesn't care about you. He don't care about the collateral damage. He's got one mission. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's going to do everything he can in his power to take you out. But God cares about each one of you. God loves every last one of you to the point he has given you the exact training, tools, instruction, and equipment to not just make it through, but to come out standing. To come out standing. We see, sing that song about our flag. As it waved and the British threw their missiles and rockets or whatever, the bombs blew up. Francis Scott Key was penning those words. Does the flag still stand? Does the flag still wave over that land of the free and the home of the brave? And when morning came through the clouds, the bombs and the rockets of night, uh, he kept looking, is the flag going to be there? And finally he saw that flag still standing. God wants you and I equipped that after the dust is all settled, after the hell has wreck havoc upon your life amen it's not hell that stands but there's a brother that still stands there equipped in the power of the might of god there's a sister still standing there equipped in the power and the might of god one that has gone back through the basic training of god in early ephesians uh, all that condition is there uh, yes it hurts uh, amen being under the attack of hell yes uh, uh, it's painful yes uh, uh, there were probably blows that were received uh, but church uh, amen those that make it to the other side can stand there knowing i've won this conflict Put on the whole armor of God. God's intention is that you'll stand through it all. Sister, if you'll come tonight. Amen. God's plan is that we'll stand tonight. Armor bearers this evening. Armor bearers tonight. Not just carriers of it. But it's on us. It's not in our closets. Or it's not for somebody else. We're the one bearing and carrying it. We're going to make it through. The devil's got some crafty, crafty tricks in this last day. And if you look back in that basic training manual of the first few chapters of Ephesians, all those things that God tell us prepare us to put that type of armor on. It's a powerful thought. God wants us to be successful for him. Let's bow our heads tonight. Sister, if you would. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you. For your goodness to us. Thank you for the word of God. We pray uh, that the words of the Lord tonight would challenge these soldiers. Lord, hell is raging all around us. Lord, there are, there are such powers that lurk in the world around God. There is one thing that we need to do, and that's get this armor of God upon our lives. Lord, have our every piece, every bit of it on top to bottom tonight. Lord, lay it on us. Lord, equip us. Lord, let us learn how to use it effectively for the kingdom of God. Move in us tonight. Lord, I pray if there's things in our life that is out of line, that we need that retraining on, God, I pray that you would move in us. Let us pray and seek the face of God. We can stand. And by standing, we will win. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for the thought thank you for the love that went into all of this and preparing us against all the wiles of the devil 
move tonight around these altars and equip soldiers for the kingdom of God. I love you tonight, Lord. Thank you for every brother and sister here. In Jesus' name.